Hey everyone, I'm Steve from GamersNexus.net and I'm back presenting the second half of our recent interview with Star Citizen's Chris Roberts. The first half talks about some of the recent developments in the game, but primarily looks at DirectX 12, Vulkan, and APIs. In this part of the interview, we talk about CryEngine and its architecture. We talk about the methodology and approach to development of Star Citizen zoning and instancing system, which is pretty critical to game. And we've spoken about that in depth with Chris in the past, so check the channel for instancing, and you will find that if you search the channel for instancing. And then finally, huge thanks to all of you for the tremendously positive response we've received on these interviews lately. If you want to help us figure out who to interview next, or if you have questions for specific people, Star Citizen or otherwise, please tweet them at, at us at GamersNexus, and I'll check those personally see what we can do and we'll set up more of these going forward because they seem to be well liked. So that is all for the intro on this one. Hit the Patreon link as always if you want to help us out in producing more of this content and remaining fairly independent from the traditional models of the internet and enjoy the interview with Chris. I'll see you all next time. Can you educate me on like a, a sort of canonical view of the uh, render pipeline when you're drawing something like um, say a character model or a ship or something like that? What what does it look like to CryEngine or to the GPU? What are the, the sort of step-by-step -step processes when you're rendering something? Well, well, I mean, what happens is because it is threaded, um, essentially um, stuff gets pushed on to um, the red. So what happens is in the, the, the sort of accumulation of the main thread, um, render gets called, and render basically on the main thread side just starts pushing uh, the objects, like um, you know, the, basically in CryEngine, they call render objects, um, and they, they they get pushed onto sort of the render queue, and it gets pushed on with the information about the object, including its location in 3D space, uh, because it's going to be threaded, so you can't depend on the stuff that's sitting in the main thread. So right. just basically, you know, pumps all this stuff onto the render thread, and then the main loop goes about doing its stuff again while the render thread carries on doing stuff. So basically the rendering and the main loop is sort of happening concurrently all the time. And uh, just at the very end of the main loop is a, a bit where the, the work the main loop's done gets pushed off to the render thread and the render thread goes about the work of actually transforming it, rendering it, doing all the rest of the stuff. Um, and um, you know, then at that side on the 3D engine side, it, it sort of you know, does the various things it needs to do like, uh, you know, the, the passes to the depth buffer and the shadow maps and all the stencils and stuff that you need for all that kind of stuff. Uh, and, you know, blasts it out. Uh, you know, it's the, the cry engine render side itself, you know, is a pretty tricky, complicated piece. So that's not one that I would be personally like excited about refactoring. Right. <laughs> we do have quite a few people here that actually wrote a bunch of it. So, um, you know, luckily they they uh, they're, they're all working. Uh, you know, and they know it. They know it better than me, because um, uh, uh, it's uh, you know it's. I would say that it's. Uh, it was written back in the day where it was less modularized and, and less sort of uh, object oriented or based. Um, so there's a lot of sort of interdependent codes and checks on flags that are passed down through various levels of the render that probably you wouldn't necessarily do in today's world. Um, and so those are kind of the things that they'll, they'll, re, they'll re, part of the idea is to re, sort of refactor the plumbing. It's sort of like you got a house, it looks really pretty, uh, it's a really nice house, uh, but some of the plumbing's a bit old, and uh, you know, you at one point have to go in and uh, redo the plumbing. So right. you, uh, you may not necessarily realize that the plumbing's got some of the issues it has, but after it, the hot water will flow better. Right, yeah. Um, but you've got the, You've hired on some of the Crytek people, or Cry yeah, yeah, yeah. People, we, yeah. Have, we actually have quite a few of the original Core Engine team. So we, we, we you know, we've got, um, I think, three of the original Far Cry team that carried on doing some of the, and from there and there, and and then there's quite a few that have been from Crisis One onwards uh, from the Engine team. So we we have a a, a decent. Uh, we don't have them all. There's plenty of other ones that are also there. Because I mean, there's a Big companies, lots of stuff, but um, you know, we've got people that helped, um, you know, basically build the engine design. Right. 
architected. Um, so they know it pretty inside out. Um, so um, so that's, that's, that's very beneficial for us. It's usually if you're a licensee, you wouldn't have that knowledge, uh, which is useful for us because we're trying to do something very different than you would normally use CryEngine for. I mean, I mean, let's be honest. What we're doing is different than, it doesn't matter whether it be Unreal or Unity or CryEngine. We would, a lot of the refactoring we've, we've been having to do, we would have to do just Yeah, because. especially the 64-bit stuff. Yeah, the 64-bit's a big also just kind of uh, uh, approaching uh, spatialization and sort of uh, kind of data passing differently because of the vast scale we have and scope and the fact that we can have a high density of like information and data, but then right. also vast areas of nothing. Uh, so, you know, more traditional sort of spatialization uh, techniques like octrees and stuff aren't particularly useful for what we do. Um, so we need things that are a bit more dynamic and a bit more fluid. So that's uh, that's something you've mentioned a few times with me now, the octrees. Um, what, what is that? <laughs> uh, okay, well, basically, when it, when it's, a, it's just sort of like subdividing. It's like uh, I take a cube, uh -huh. right, and then I can go inside this cube and say, just imagine me subdividing into four more cubes. Okay. And then when you go into one of those cubes, you can subdivide it into four more cubes. So it's just, it's a, it's a, it's a way to sort of uh, pass out um, essentially areas or data for like figuring out whether you're occluded or not occluded or whether you'd be visible in the camera fairly efficiently without having to have it as a flat, like a flat list. Okay. Like one thing you could you just have a flat list of objects, and you could just check them against the view frustrum whether they would be in the camera or not in the camera, right? But then you know if you have ten thousand objects in the scene, you're checking against ten thousand. Now, doing something like this, you could say, oh well, uh, you know you could you could basically take the view frustrum, uh, you know, and essentially figure out against an octree, and then figure out what sort of containers essentially would be. Um, visible, and then you would deal with the objects. I see. Um, and, and so you move. Rend typically, in the engines, you move the, the the render objects around these around an octree structure, um, and it's just sort of an efficient way to um, kind of get to and pass and figure out what objects from what area pretty quickly. Right. Um, but it's uh, you know it's it's sort of more it's more rigid, right? It's sort of like you start with a certain size and it subdivides down and down and down. So it's not it's it's, it's not quite as um, flexible or movable um, because we have issues like you know like this is what the zone system does is you know imagine having a planet right and this planet has a city and other people on it right. Well, the zone system uh, and you know really what we call a zone container holds all that. Now, if that planet is orbiting, right, moving throughout space, right, uh, what would happen in an up tree? Because an up tree has no, an up tree is fixed. That would mean that the the planet and the objects on it would all actually be transitioning from one part, one area of the up tree to another area of the up tree. And you'd have to be moving them around. You'd be sorting them inside your up tree all the time, right? right? So you'd be sorting thousands of objects. But with us, that's not the case because we have these zones or zone containers if you the way you want to think of them, and the zone containers contain their own frame of reference. And so we basically, it's you know like a Russian doll. We contain things within <laughs> things, and at the very top level, we move the very top level around. You don't have to move anything inside that top level because they're all still relative to each other perfectly. Right. So and so it allows us to do things like um, you know, planetary orbits or ships flying around with lots of stuff inside, uh, and not worry so much about. Um, you know, like moving around and you know, moving them around a fixed uh, spatial data structure. Um, so it's much more, uh, much more suitable for our uses. It's not a typical use in a three D game because usually in a three D game, the the structure itself is you know like you're walking around a map. Well, that's fixed, right? Right. So so you know the plants and the buildings they aren't moving. So that's fine. They can all be because the octree then allows you to sort of determine which plants or what part of the building you'd see really quickly. And the only things that are really moving through them are things like your character or a bullet or something like that. Sure. Um, and so um, for a typical shooter, things like Oct I mean, most engines use an, an octree for sort of its, its kind of render um, like pipeline, basically, right. in terms of what you'll see, what you won't see, everything else. Um, 
but for us, obviously, it, you know, it, it's not that suitable. We'll be doing a bunch of work that, that we'd rather not be doing. Um, and 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 you you know, and even though Arctrees are fairly efficient in sorting data and moving data around, because you're just generally moving pointers around, uh, when it's a big enough space and a big enough data, it, it you know, it does actually take an appreciable time. So what we do um, uh, it allows for sort of the the moving of you know, because like you can always think of a big spaceship as a mini FPS level or a planet as a mini FPS level or something like that. So it allows for for movement of these things. Um, Without having to, um, you know, have the challenges of, you know, a fixed spatial data structure, right? And we, can, and we can and we can sort of scale the data structure inside each one of the zones to um, be appropriate for the data we have inside it. That's uh, <laughs> this is why I love talking to devs who are more familiar with like the engineering side of things, because um, we, as you know, we look at a lot of hardware mostly, and to understand the hardware properly, it really helps to understand some of the software driving it. Right. That's that's where my knowledge pool is really shallow. So it uh, definitely a huge help to get the walkthrough. Uh, much appreciated on that. No problem at all.